Hello and welcome to the Killer Bit. I'm Rick and I'm here talking to Jason, who is the creator of the Castle Doctrine, which is a very interesting uh, indie developer game that I've been playing quite a lot of. Now, the first thing, obviously, your your surname is it Roa? Am I getting that right? <laughs> Uh, I don't know how to even pronounce It's a German name. I don't even know how to pronounce it. So uh, we've just Americanized it to roar like a lion. Okay. Well, Jason like roar. Just then. roar like one syllable. Oh, brilliant. Right. Now, for anyone who's not played this game, it's, well, I, I think I've managed to just describe it in layman's terms as best as it's kind of a tower defense-y thing almost, but with some interesting twists. Uh, the game is set in 1991, I believe. Yeah, that's correct. Yep. And you're playing as a guy who's down on his luck and trying to defend his family uh, you do this by building defenses around your safe which contains your meager belongings that's right um, and then you rob people and steal their belongings right no so you know if you want to go further with the the tower defense uh, metaphor it's like a it's like a tower defense game where other players are the creeps <laughs> which is kind of uh, funny to call them creeps given the context yeah. and uh and uh, other players are the creeps, and there's permadeath. Yeah, I was going to say, that's one of the things that really made it interesting for me, is is the permadeath. Now, I'm just going into the, the game menu here. To These are all the things you can build your house defenses from. Um, and in my experience, probably the most deadly are all these at the bottom. Um, pit bulls. Like, just, just horrible pit bulls. The moment you see a pit bull, I generally try and leave the house, because... They, they pretty much guarantee, like, heat-seeking permadeath. You, you guys are over in, in the UK there, right? Yeah. You guys don't even have pit bulls in the UK, right? Uh, we get lots of sort of angry terrier types. There's some, there's some pretty ferociously maligned dogs. I mean, most of them aren't, but we we get the uh, we get the picture easy enough. Right, right. And uh, electric floor plates as well. Now, I generally have a little bit of a panic on whenever I see electric floor plates everywhere. Uh, and as soon as I finish filling my house with pit bulls, uh, there we go. That should do it. Um, I'll rob another house and undoubtedly die. So, while I, uh, when you finish defending your house, you have to make it to your safe safely to prove that it can be done. So there's always a route through. So I just did that there. It's the easiest thing in the world. Um, my house is in no way secure, but it means I can show you somebody else's. Now, while I rob Lewis Ronald Roberts' house, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your inspirations for the game? Right, right. So, um... A few years ago, uh, you know, we, we kind of live this uh, sort of starving artist lifestyle, right? Where I'm, I'm working on video games, uh, essentially full time, my own video games, um, and it's bringing in a little bit of income, uh, but not 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 so much income. And uh, and so we we kind of have been living in very cheap places for a long time. And and one of the one of the cheap places that we moved to was Las Cruces, New Mexico. Uh, this was about uh, four and a half years ago now. Um, we ended up living there for about two and a half years before we we ended up fleeing. <laughs> uh, but uh, in in Las Cruces, uh, you know, you you may say you have dogs in the UK that are vicious or whatever, but you 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 haven't seen anything like what they uh, they managed to breed in Las Cruces. Oh, fantastic! Um, I mean, I think they they must there must be some sort of you know hormone injections or something involved, right? Oh, right. So um, real real big mean things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like dogs that kind of look like like small lions, right? Wow. <laughs> Well, uh, anyway, uh, so, you know, living there and with those kinds of dogs around, it was a little unnerving, right? Because they're kept in front yards on chains and you walk by and they snarl at you and chase you up and down like, along the fence as you walk by. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it didn't really come into focus for us until one of them got off a leash and, and ran out into the road and bit my wife. <laughs> oh, so uh, and we had, you know, she was pregnant at the time with our third child and, and our like one and a half year old was on the back of her bike. Oh, and whoa. my like, I think a seven or so year old child uh, was on the back of my bike. Right. So we we're out for a family bike ride on a Saturday morning down to the farmer's market. It was the dog wasn't really even on a leash. I mean, calling it a leash is a kind of a, a, a stretch. It was on it was on a piece of twine. <laughs> so, so its head slipped out of the twine and ran out into this busy road and ran right up to my wife and bit her. Right. Oh, wow. um, so then we kind of had to really come, you know, I mean, self-defense is like a philosophical question that a lot of people kind of muse about. And there's all these kind of thought experiments like, 
you know, if someone was doing this to you, is it okay to defend yourself and through what means and when is, you know, killing somebody else justified, you know, if they're about to kill you or, you know, there's all these big philosophical questions. Yeah. Um, but it was really brought into focus when I was, I wasn't even defending myself in this case. I was, you know, potentially, and I failed, right? I failed to defend my, my spouse and my uh, two small children uh, at the time. And uh, so it, uh, it really kind of made me, you know, have to come face to face with exactly what I believed and what I what I was going to do next time, right? Mm. Um, so we did, we did end up, you know, arming ourselves. We had already been carrying pepper spray in case of dogs, but when you're on a bike and so on, pepper spray just doesn't work. It blows back in your face. Yeah, uh, which is one of the most important lessons in the Castle Doctrine, right? Is that um, security has a cost, um, and that's that's the the main reason for you you know you having to kind of reach your own vault without tools. Uh, because, you know, uh, it makes you kind of balance your own security, right? You can't make your security so crazy and so convoluted and so Machiavellian or whatever that you can't, uh, you can't remember how to get through it, right? Mm. I mean, and that's the reason we don't all have 25 locks on our doors, right, with 25 separate keys. Uh, because at some point, you know, the, the cost of the security outweighs the, the, uh, the amortized benefit <laughs> over time at preventing yeah. people from getting in. Well, as um, I'm, I'm sure people just saw as I was... Uh... As you were talking, I managed to get myself cornered by a pit bull, uh, and I spent about two minutes dancing back and forth. Uh, obviously, it's 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 that peculiar kind of real time turn based. Every time you move, everything else moves as well. So I got to dance back and forth with a pit bull for a couple of minutes, and then everything died. And I've just reset up my house um, using the the pit bulls as a sort of a, a good lesson point. So everyone can watch, right, watch right. that so, die as well. So, um... You know, a lot of people say, "Oh, this game is is really harsh. It's you know, it's just brutal on me. It's you know, it's fury infuriating or frustrating." But the interesting thing about it is that you know, like that situation you got yourself into with that pit bull. Yeah, it's a situation that you chose to get yourself into. Yeah. Um, and and even if you say, "Well, of course, what can you do in this game except rob other people?" So you know, obviously that's not even really a choice. You kind of have to do it. I mean, I, I, flat out, you don't necessarily have to rob anybody in this game. But of course, most no. I've, I've just I've just escaped from a house. Oh no, I decided. Most most people do, but but you know, even when you're in the act of robbing, you know that permadeath is possible, uh, and you st most of the time human nature makes you take one more step than you know you should take, right? <laughs> well, that, that's just happening uh, again. Ele electric floor every time. Right, right, yeah. Right. So where was your bottle? Where was your wire cutters? Why didn't you cut it? You know, where was your where's your bottle of water? You got to come back, right? Yeah. See now, this and, is this uh, is my this is my uh, next point on the game. It, They've seen me walk into two different houses now and die horribly, uh, and it's it's very interesting that you you do have all these extra tools that you can get to to make them work, um, the tools to make robbing a house possible, um, and that's that's a really nice feature. One I've not played with very much. I didn't spend all my money on defending the house, right, right, and then just run into other people and and it doesn't work out. So. Right. I mean, you know, the idea that, you know, I, I, everyone has asked, you know, why can't I have a button to instantly rebuild my house on my next life? Yeah. Why can't I, why do I have to die testing my own house? Or why do I have to, why does it have to be so harsh like it is and so on? But any of those concessions that I would make would change the way that you end up playing the game, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, Absolutely. And so I want you to feel like you have to be extremely, extremely careful like there's a serious, serious consequence to screwing up. Um, you know, most games have no serious consequence. Even roguelikes, um, you, you kind of, because the maze is randomly generated that you're in, and, you know, the only consequence really is that you'll never be able to see this maze again, and that this progress that you made through this one maze will be lost, but it's, it's this sort of ephemeral progress anyway, right? Even if you got all the way to the end on that life um, and, and beat the roguelike, you can still play again, right? It's not like it's like that one instance of the roguelike is, is the sort of ephemeral thing that's kind of like gone in a poof of smoke, and you kind of don't even cry. You just like hit restart and want to play again, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, and even like a game like FTL, where you're kind of upgrading your ship and 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 kind of making pretty substantial progress, um, you know, you're not really putting a lot of work into that ship, right? You're not really putting a lot. You're like pour, pouring blood, sweat, and tears into it, painstakingly thinking about it and planning it out. Yeah, it's kind of opportunistic, right? Oh, I got this upgrade. Yeah, I'll install it and replace this other cannon. Oh yeah, I got this new crew member. I'll put him over in the in the shield bay right now. You know, um, and in this game, 
You may sit there for an hour pouring your blood, sweat, and tears, you know, hundreds of mouse clicks and a lot of deep thinking into designing a good house. And you have a lot on the line, right? Um, so I, and I want you to feel like you have a lot on the line. I, I don't want you just like barreling through someone's house and, uh, and, and, and behaving when, when, when people rob houses in real life, they don't just barrel through, right? <laughs> uh, they bring tools and they're very careful. And if something looks wrong or they hear the owner inside or, you know, or they, a guard dog comes out, you don't stick around, right? No. Well, I've, I've, again, I've just had a, a quite a good run where I got to play with, <coughs> excuse me, I got to play with some of the tools uh, chopped through a wooden wall, um, pointed out um, quite happily that the the saw only works for one wall, um, and really scoped out the place from the outside. And again, everything went horribly wrong, and I've had to start again. <laughs> and I lo- it's there's a there's a real addictive quality to the game, which is fantastic. Um, but the art style is very intriguing. Where you know why this particular sort of minimalist pixelated art style? What? What right, right. You... So I, I've, I've come to believe um, uh, that these kinds of more abstract, you know, depictions of things mm-hmm. actually make give things greater impact, greater emotional impact, because you are more able to relate to them. Because they're not, they're not specific. They're very generalized, right? You can't even like the characters don't even have eyes or any noticeable facial features. They're just sort of um, like cartoons, right? They're like this represents. This is an icon that represents a guy, and these are icons that represent you know, this spouse and these children, and this is an icon that represents a pit bull, which leaves room for your imagination to sort of fill in the rest, right? Um, you know, and people all, all, it's widely, widely kind of held that, you know, uh, e- novels, novels, people, a lot of people like novels better than movies because they say the pictures are better, even if the novel has no pictures, right? Because it's like these pictures you create in your mind. Um, and uh, and you kind of imagine the characters however you want to. So this is, uh, you know, it doesn't leave as much room as that, right? You see that you have a red-haired spouse, and so you have to imagine that she's sort of red-haired and the pit bull looks brown and whatever, right? Mm. Um, but uh, but it, still, it still makes them more symbolic and makes them kind of like more open to kind of your own interpretation. Um, you know, and this is, this is true for cartooning and other, other sort of more abstract um, uh, representational forms as well. Um, and I think it really works. I mean, I think that if there were very specific looking characters in here, uh, you wouldn't be able to identify with them as well as you can. Uh, you know, I guess I'm thinking about like, um, a wolf among us or something, right. Where the characters are extremely specific Yeah. and and they uh, specific looking, right. Uh, and they have specific voices and so on. And so that, that kind of ends up kind of putting them at, at, at arm's length from you, right. You know, they're not you, they're no, you know, they're not anybody that you know, so you kind of are distanced from them and kind of observing them as characters instead of feeling like uh, they're yours. You know, they're not really your characters. That's a, yeah, that's a very good way to do it, actually. But of course, you know, and pixel art is just, well, pixel art is just one way to do that. But I'm, you know, I could also make cartoons, right? But I, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm attracted to pixel art because it's, it's also at home. It's like a native uh, representation on a computer. It feels like something that it came from a computer you know I'm, I'm i'm kind of hesitant to say like i'm going to make watercolor paintings and stick them in a game or i'm going to make pen and ink drawings and stick them in a game or oil paintings and stick them in a game mm. or cell shaded comics and stick them in a game because those are that's kind of like like borrowing um techniques from other mediums right um yeah and and so i wanted something that looks like and all my games in one way or another have looked like they are kind of at home yeah. on a computer. That- this is a, a digital platform, so a, a, a digital art style is obviously, obviously. Uh- now that said, a lot of people don't like it, right? A lot of people say like, "This game looks old. This game looks retro. This game is crappy. This is programmer art." You know, whatever they say. Yeah. Um, and clearly, graphics have always sold games, right? I mean, <clears throat> I'm I'm just as guilty as anyone else of of that. You know, going all the way back to my childhood, where I'd look at the screenshots in the back of the Nintendo box and throw a game down at the store because just the screenshots didn't look good enough, right? <laughs> uh, and I think people still buy games based on screenshots and buy games based on pretty art. Um, and and the more three-dimensional, the better in, in, t- in terms of marketing and so on. Yeah. Um, so I'm kind, of, I'm kind of fighting an uphill battle, but, you know. I'm just... Uh-oh. Ah, oh, damn it. I'm, I'm trying to get at least one successful sort of house robbery in during the course of this, and it's... Well, it's not happening. Well, yet. how? Where are you? Where are you uh, fishing on the list? You got to go down for it. Oh no, I was I was way way down on the list. 
<laughs> You're like robbing the three dollar house. <laughs> I think like six hundred dollars. Uh, I I got out of one with like five hundred dollars, uh, but I didn't use all my equipment on the way in, so like I actually did it at a massive loss. Right, right. Your your net because <laughs> the the vault was empty, so I had to walk out the front door. Um, and, oh, and but you found the vault. I found the vault, but it was empty. Uh, and I, to be fair, I only found the vault because there was somebody in before me had cut through a lot of walls. Which is, is that's something I like, the fact that they're, they're persistent. If somebody dies three quarters of the way to the vault, you've only got 25% of the way left to go. Sorry I've, about that, I just had a phone ring on this end. That's alright. The, uh, the, like, the music's very atmospheric. It's quite, I, I, I don't want to say creepy, but it's daunting. It certainly puts you in the, there we go. Brilliant. Job done. Oh, you empty your backpack to make room for the vault's contents. You stole $100 and left $800 worth of stores behind. <laughs> Wonderful. But that's, I mean, that's that's the gamble of it all. I like it. I like it a lot. So, like you said yourself, the game gets slated for being sort of unforgiving and frustrating. But it's it's very addictive. Um, I've, I've spent far too much time... Just, just well, no, so that's, that's another question, right? Is, is, is addictiveness, you know, a, a good quality, right? Yeah. Um, and in games, we well, often kind of talk about them as if it is, right? Um, that we want to become hooked on these things and that, 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 you know, a game is only good if it's addictive. And we, we praise a game by saying that. Um, you know, some people say that's kind of like Stockholm Syndrome, right? Yeah. <laughs> like you, you learn to love your captor. And I think, I think that's, yeah, I think that's... Um, I think that's particularly fitting in this game. Stockholm syndrome. Yeah, I think I think that's. Uh, I think. So so, but there are some things about the game that sort of subvert that addictiveness, right? Mm. Um, uh, one of the things is that uh, the game is not random. So in a game like FTL or a game like Spelunky um, or a lot of other roguelike type games, when you die and there's permadeath, you have this just one more play kind of itch always, right? Because next time there might not be two solar flares in a row. You know, next time you might find really good crew members like within the first couple of hops, right? Yeah. Uh, or in Spelunky, next time you might find a shop within the first three levels that has a shotgun and a cape, you know, <laughs> in the shop, right? Yeah. Um, so, so there's that element of luck to it. Yeah, that just one more roll, that just one more. It's like being at a casino and, you, you know, after you just lost, you just want to play just one more, right? Maybe it'll, maybe the wheel will come up, you know, red this time instead of black, right? Um, so in this game, you kind of when you die there's this tendency to rage quit right because when you die it's it's always your fault it's never like oh that was just a bad why did i get two solar flares in the row next time that won't happen yeah it's like next time it's still going to be me playing and i still haven't really learned my lesson yet and i'm still probably going to screw up and wow i shouldn't have screwed up this time and i feel really stupid and i just lost this house that i worked for an hour on <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've done that. I, I've quit. I quit. But, you know, I guess it's sort of like I'd rather have you do that um, than play just one more game, just one more game, just one more game all mm. night long. Yeah. Just sort of quit and say, I need to kind of regroup mentally, you know, and, and then a couple of days later, come back and be like, OK, now I'm ready. I'm not going to make those same mistakes this time, um, you know, and, and have it be sort of like something that doesn't destroy lives the way that certain games tend to well anybody watching this is getting the chance to just watch me completely play around with i'm more of the 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 robbing element than the building element because i've, I've spent a lot of time building houses and it, it rarely works out because i normally die two or three robberies in so like i've 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 very much adopted the mentality of my house is pretty much empty um and you know, if I get one or two decent robberies and build up the capital, that's when I'll put the money into building the house. Otherwise, I'll spend 20 minutes building a house and then everything will go horribly wrong and I'll, and I'll, I'll get very frustrated with right, it. Right, right. So, so you kind of, you, you, you're kind of putting like some sort of placeholder security in. I'm not, I'm not even doing that. I'm just clicking ready to go and, uh, and, and... Oh, right. So you're just leaving your family, you're leaving your family undefended. Yeah, exactly. Right, but see, you'll you'll pay for that later. If if you get a if you get a big score or something from a robbery, you'll come home and you'll be ready to build your house, and then maybe your family will be killed, right? Yeah, and then you'll have to live the rest of that rich life alone. Yeah, yeah. There's 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 lots of little bits like that around. Oh, oh, surrounded by dogs again. So have you have you taken a look at the uh, at the auctions? I haven't. I haven't actually. 
Now tell us a little bit about those. So, so are you back in your house now? Yes. Okay. So did you? So there's that auction button there. Uh, return to my house. Yes. Oh, I didn't see that before. All oh, right. Yeah, a lot, a lot, a lot of people don't notice it. So, um, there's something like 150 unique paintings in the game that were made by some of my friends and some of my family and some colleagues and some, you know, ga other game designers that I'm fans fans of or friends with, you know, so on. So. In the game, they go up for auction. I think they start at like $100,000 each, and yeah. then the price slowly comes down over time. And then whoever buys the painting first, you know, who says, oh, it's at $5,000, i am going to buy it, you know, gets it, right? Of course, if you wait longer, it may go down. If nobody wants it, it could go down all the way to $1. Yeah. And uh, and there's only one only one person in the game at a time can have any one of those paintings, right? So, so if you have the Derek U. Watermelon painting, nobody else in the world has the Derek U. Watermelon painting. And it's in your house. And of course, if somebody reaches your vault, they can take it from you. That's really um, interesting. I like that a lot. Then you can go and try and get it back from whoever took it and so on. Uh, and then, you know, when somebody finally dies who owns a painting, the painting is returned to the it auction house. Goes back on auction. And, and goes back on auction for $100,000 again. Oh, wow. That, that's a really, that's a nice mechanic. I can't ever see me ever amassing quite that amount of money. But it's... <laughs> well, you can always steal a painting from somebody. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's much more likely, actually. And, you know, some paintings, certain people, like some, I think... Maybe Derek gave me like one painting, but Derek used the guy who made Spelunky, um, but uh, or one of the guys who made Spelunky, I should say. Some people gave me like a whole set of paintings, right? Um, or or one one per, one of my cousins gave me like like three different series, right? So he's got like four paintings in one series, four paintings in another series, and so there's, there's the possibility to collect these like triptychs or yeah. You keep you keep mentioning like FTL and Spelunky. Have, 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 are these games that have particularly influenced you, or is there? Oh, yeah, um, why do I keep it? Yeah, yeah. Um, are, I, are they just just sort of friends of yours, or? No, no. So I think that you know there was this sort of roguelike renaissance, right? That that happened. Um, you know, and this was kind of a kind of a few years ago, really, in the especially in the independent game space, and it hasn't really migrated its way too far into the mainstream game world. I, I guess maybe you sort of see it, like little hints of it in things like Demon Souls or or Dark Souls. Yeah. But I'm thinking about you know I'm thinking about a game like Far Cry Two or something. I was like that should have been a roguelike. <laughs> uh, so so um, so anyway, indie people became very upset, and I was one of them. Right as soon as I kind of like saw some of these ne neo roguelike games, I was like totally interested in them um not just because they were addictive which they were uh but because they, were, they had you know very deep and interesting gameplay mm. and they sort of highlighted a lot of really interesting things about sort of human nature right because they they kind of put you in these situations where you kind of know better and you end up taking a risk and, and losing everything and the, yeah. and the sting of losing is so harsh right that you you end up kind of laughing at yourself in a way and uh and I guess FDL doesn't do that as much as Spelunky does, right? So Spelunky just has all these almost like deeply comic moments that you kind of bring upon yourself, right? Yeah. I, I shouldn't have tried to rob that shopkeeper. Why did I try to rob that shopkeeper? <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, so I think, yeah, it had a huge influence. Those kinds of things had a huge, huge influence on me. Uh, and they had a huge influence on a number of other people as well. Where yeah. it's sort of like, you know, if you look at like Edmund McMillan putting out uh, Binding of Isaac, it was sort of like, you know, there's this kind of roguelike thing happening. It's kind of the zeitgeist, right? Everyone was kind of working on some kind of roguelike thing yeah, um, that yeah. I knew. Everyone everyone I knew was working on one. And and I put out something called Inside a Starfield Sky, which is sort of roguelike-y, right? I mean, it has like uh, procedurally generated levels and so on, hmm. um, but just doesn't have the permadeath element. Um, so yeah, that was that was definitely kind of... My, my head was kind of swimming around in that space when I was conceiving of something like the Castle Doctrine. Which is kind of, in a way, you could call it just a, a player-generated roguelike, right? I mean, yeah. so where you know the dungeons haven't been haven't have not been designed by a random randomized algorithm. They they've been designed by another player with this express purpose of keeping you out at all costs. Yeah, I mean, you you reference Dark Souls there now. Now most of us at the uh, Killer It are, are huge Dark Souls fans. I don't think Franz got very far in it, but certainly the rest of us have, have always had a good crack at it. And and Toby, I don't think has ever not mention Dark Souls for more than sort of 24 hours at a time. <laughs> um, so that, that sort of unforgiving style of gameplay is quite appealing to us. Well, I mean, I, I, you know, to say that it's just unforgiving, I think, I think what it does, all games that don't have that, right, mm. end up with a loop that is, ends up being very repetitive and very grating because you can kind of grind your way through any of the challenges in the game when the checkpoints are so close together 
that all you really need to do is, you know, essentially try a series of, of 20 button and stick moves again and again and again and again and again and again and again to get past that section, right? Yeah. Um, even if you look at something like, you know, one of the Uncharted games or um, The Last of Us, you know, Naughty Dog style stuff, there's some pretty steep challenges in those games, especially if you're playing on the harder difficulty settings. Mm, yeah. But, and I, and I appreciate it for that. I'm like, yes, this game, you know, has... I got to learn these systems. I've got to master this stuff to get through this. I'm not just kind of watching a movie where I occasionally push a button for a quick time event. There's some really hard like tactical uh, combat and stuff in these games. But because the checkpoints are so close together, you can kind of like, and I get into these loops where I'm just like, there's a hard part in the game I'm having trouble getting through. And I literally am sitting there for an hour playing the same thing over and over and over every two minutes, going back to the loading screen every two minutes you know, trying again or going to the death sc- and Uncharted, I guess, doesn't even have really a loading screen. It just shows you dying and then jumps you right back instantly to the checkpoint. Yeah. But, you know, just repeating the same. And again, it, it kind of what ends up happening is it detracts from the meaning of what you're doing um, because you're just kind of going through these motions over and over again. And it's like if you actually take a scene in a movie, even like your favorite, most amazing movie, and you take one little scene and you watch it over and over and over again. Yeah. It starts to become really stale and really contrived feeling yeah. um you know and i've when i'm studying a film sometimes i end up doing that and it almost ruins part that part of the movie for me right yeah <laughs> uh, and so in games we're doing that all the time um and, and so i think that you know we cut we look at these other games there's only very few of them right especially in the mainstream space that we call punishing or or whatever but what they're really doing is 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 adding making the entire gameplay experience meaningful and removing that just incredibly, you know, annoying repetition. I mean, <laughs> yes, and, and like even in, in Demon's Souls, yes, you repeat the same level over and over again, but it's so long, right? That you're not, you kind of make totally different choices every time, try a totally different tactic next time, hmm. you know, a totally different loadout, a totally different, like, you know, try going left instead of right this time. And so uh, it just doesn't, yeah, it just doesn't have that same yeah. feel. So the Castle Doctrine is finished. Uh, obviously, it released 29th of January. You are still sort of doing updates in little bits. Is what are your sort of future projects? Are you are you taking a little bit of a break now? You've got a game out, or um, are you planning on expanding this? No, yeah. So I, I'm I'm kind of a you know I, I work on one game until it's done, and then I I move on, right? So I'm not someone who wants to shackle myself to one project forever. I mean, I've been working on this game for more than two years. Mm. Um, I put out a little update today that just kind of fixes a couple of things that came up when there were like all of a sudden you know 3,000 active players in one yeah. day you know like yeah. the fact that the that, house that's, list all, is that's so, always gonna uh, always gonna <laughs> the fact that the house list is too long to scroll through and you have to scroll through 100 pages you know those kinds of issues right mm-hmm. it's like whoa I, I didn't even think about that <laughs> you know so so kind of working on those kinds of things and just kind of like making sure that you know the game holds up under under very heavy play and so on but yeah it's just a very minor update most players won't even notice the difference of what's you know what's new in version 32 so uh yeah and then i'm i'm starting to think about what i'm going to do next but you know i i don't have a bunch of back burner ideas i always like force myself to only work on one thing at a time and like yeah. and push back burner ideas out of my mind don't even let myself think about them because i don't want to lose my uh, momentum on them if i if i let myself get all excited like a year ago for some new idea that i couldn't work on yet by the time of the year passed, I could actually have a chance to work on it. I'd have lost my momentum. So, <laughs> so I'm just starting to kind of put my lightning rod up right now. And, and yeah, so sort of waiting for that little bit of inspiration. Yeah, yeah. So, do you want to give us a little bit of a, a plug for your site? And yeah, if you just can... do a, if you just do a a Google search for um, for the Castle Doctrine. Fair enough. It's also on Steam, and I also have another game on Steam inside of Starfield Sky, which is an infinite procedurally generated recursive shooter. <laughs> Uh, another very that, strange that, game. That, like I say, that's a bit of a mouthful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I've made. If you go to my website, there's a number of free games on there as well. That you know, I've over the past eight or so years, I've made 17 games. So there's a pretty, pretty big catalog of. Uh, you know, if you've never, if you've never seen my stuff before, there's a, there's a lot of stuff to, to check out there. Oh, that's great. Right. Well, thanks you very much for your time. I've had a lot of fun playing this. I've probably died about 40 times while talking to you. Um, <laughs> But like anybody watching this, don't let that put you off. It's a lot of fun. It's it's painfully addictive in just about every every form of the word that you could uh, you could put that. If you want to see more of our stuff, obviously you can give us a, a like and a subscribe. Uh, uh, we're on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash the killer bits. We're on Twitter at the killer bits. Um, I've been Rick. This has been Jason, who's been fantastic to talk to, and uh, hopefully we see you guys again soon. Cheers. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>